Okay, we're in the home stretch. It's a short act, so this will be a short lecture, so let's get to it. However, make sure you're still reviewing your notes, taking more notes, and organizing all your research. Act 5 begins with the doctor and a gentlewoman discussing Lady Macbeth's strange behavior, namely that she has been sleepwalking and doing strange things. This is a moment of tragic triumph for the audience, as we see this once strong and confident woman brought low by her own guilt. Just as Macbeth warned after Duncan's murder, neither of them would ever have a restful sleep again, and this is the ironic fate that Shakespeare has created for Lady Macbeth. Even in sleep, she is forced to relive her crimes. This is symbolized by the action she takes, the fact that she must always have a light to scare away the darkness, and the constant wringing of her hands as she tries to wash the blood from them. Indeed, one of the most famous lines of the play is when she cries, Out, damn spot! Out, I say! We now see the foreshadowing from when she mocked Macbeth by saying how a little water was all they needed. Now she echoes Macbeth's fear that not even Neptune's oceans can clean them. Even more, we see Lady Macbeth taking on guilt for the murder of Macduff's family as well as for Banquo, events that she had no direct part in, but still suffers for. It's interesting to see how the Macbeths are so connected in their deeds, and again, Shakespeare's use of irony is apparent. They swore to stick together in their plots, and that vow has followed them into their own individual hells. As the doctor says at the end of the scene, unnatural deeds do breed unnatural troubles, and the Macbeths are learning this the hard way. Scene 2 is a quick check-in with Malcolm's army, where Lennox and two other characters we never see again mention how Macbeth has fortified his castle at Dunsinane in what seems to be the final brave act of a doomed man, and how his men fight only out of fear and not loyalty, which is why they'll lose. It's interesting to see how, even in his murderous insanity, Macbeth is still viewed, from a certain point of view, as brave, hearkening back to the very first description of him. We do also get one final mention of the ill-fitting clothing motif, as Angus mocks Macbeth by saying, Now does he feel his title hang loose about him, like a giant's robe upon a dwarfish thief. Like many a foolish teenager has learned, eventually we all trip over our baggy clothes. Scene 3 proves this, as Macbeth rants and raves at his servants, flaunting the prophecies as protection against any army that might come for him. However, when he's alone, Macbeth becomes more introspective as he reflects on where his decisions have taken him. As he laments, my way of life is fallen into the seer, the yellow leaf, and that which should accompany old age, as honor, love, obedience, troops of friends, I must not look to have, but in their stead, curses, not loud, but deep, mouth honor, breath which the poor heart would fain deny and dare not. This is interesting to see how Shakespeare handles Macbeth here, because even though he is a mass murdering tyrant, he is a self aware one. Macbeth knows that he is hated and feared, and that his men serve only out of terror, but he asks no forgiveness, and this is an interesting facet of his character. He has made horrible decisions, and everything that has happened to him and that will happen to him, he does deserve, and while this saddens him, he accepts it. Macbeth is a terrible human being, and yet Shakespeare still manages to create a degree of empathy, not sympathy, but empathy, for the fallen thing. All he has left is his wife, and as a doctor enters to tell him, even she is slipping away. All that being said, scene 4 is where Shakespeare shows just how carefully he's plotted this story out, and just how foolish Macbeth has always been for believing in the prophecies so blindly. Malcolm, Macduff, and Seward are talking strategy, and notice that the forest they're camped in sure has a lot of trees, and that it might be a good idea to cut down some branches and have the soldiers carry them in front in order to mask their numbers. The name of the forest? Burnham Wood. Scene 5 brings us two key events, the death of Lady Macbeth through suicide and Macbeth's famous monologue on the nature of life. His response to Lady Macbeth's death is open for debate. Some scholars believe that he is indifferent to it, as she would have died sooner or later, whereas others believe that he is saddened that there will not be proper time to mourn. I tend to believe in the latter. It adds to the tragedy in that their lives together were also destroyed by their choices. I've said this a couple times, but what's coming up here is arguably Macbeth's most famous speech from the entire play. Tomorrow. And tomorrow. And tomorrow. Creeps in this petty pace from day to day to the last syllable of recorded time. And all our yesterdays of lighted fools away to dusty death. Out. Out. Brief candle. 
life's but a walking shadow. A poor player that struts and frets his hour upon the stage. And then he's heard no more. Here's a tale told by an idiot, full of sound and fury signifying nothing. His musings on the futility of life and the imagery that Shakespeare uses are truly memorable and are still images that we see and use today. The metaphor of life being a flickering candle, the metaphor of life being a bit player on the stage of life making a whole lot of pointless noise and meaning nothing. It's a cynical but logical view on it and it can be argued that Shakespeare is using Macbeth as a way of showing how prophecy or no prophecy, peasant or king, all life ends and even our legacies will eventually fade. We saw this with his earlier musings on how he has no heirs, Banquo's prophecy, and even Macduff's sorrow at the death of his children. It's a dark and depressing theme for a dark and depressing play, and one that asks the audience to consider their own beliefs. Do you believe in free will, or do you believe in destiny? Shakespeare gives us Macbeth's answer, but leaves us to form our own conclusions. And the bad news just keeps coming as a messenger tells Macbeth that they seem to have spotted Burnham Wood marching towards the castle. Macbeth freaks right out. He had been counting on the prophecies coming true and protecting him, but refused to acknowledge that their coming true also sealed his fate, tying into that same thematic question of whether or not Macbeth is a tool of destiny or the orchestrator of his own defeat. Regardless, Macbeth chooses to face his threat as he would have done in his more honorable days, head on with his sword in hand. Scene 6 is literally just Malcolm and Macduff yelling, let's go get him boys, and scene 7 involves Macbeth killing young Seward, the son of Malcolm's ally. It's a quick scene, but it shows how Macbeth is banking on the second prophecy concerning no man of woman born. Macbeth even warns the kid that the boy doesn't want any of this, and because young Seward was of woman born, he dies. Macduff and then Malcolm and Seward come running in like Scooby-Doo cartoons, searching for Macbeth, and the scene ends. Finally, we come to the climactic battle between Macbeth and Macduff. Macbeth tells Macduff that he has been avoiding him, perhaps because of the prophecy, but also, as he says, because he has already killed too many Macduffs. So take that as you will. He then repeats how there is no way that Macduff can beat him until Macduff drops the huge twist. He's a C-section baby, and therefore was not technically born. <laughs> You know how you'll ask a teacher, can I go to the bathroom? And they'll say, I don't know, can you? It's kind of a jerk move. And Macbeth realizes that this is exactly what the witches did to him. However, it's important for us to remember that at no point throughout any of the prophecies in the entire play did the witches ever say how or when the prophecies would come true. Everything that Macbeth and Lady Macbeth did were their own choices, and the question of whether or not they were destined to make those choices doesn't really matter. In the words of Macbeth, it is a tale told by an idiot full of sound and fury signifying nothing. Regardless, Macbeth refuses to run and he refuses to surrender, as Shakespeare brings the captain's Act 1 description full circle in a tragically ironic way, as Macduff finally gets his revenge and fulfills the final prophecies. The final scene begins with Ross doing what he does and delivering the news of the death of young Seward, but says that he dies bravely like a soldier, so that makes it better, I guess. Macduff enters with Macbeth's head, just like in the prophecy, and Malcolm reclaims his throne, ending Macbeth's reign of bloody terror and bringing the play full circle, as we started with the defeat of a traitorous rebel and we end with the defeat of the man who beat him. The great chain of being has been restored and Shakespeare ends on a hopeful note, as life can now return to its normal course. And that's it. Macbeth has come to an end. Now remember that everything that I've given you here is just one interpretation out of hundreds, and most of what I said is entirely open for debate. All you can do is what Macbeth and Lady Macbeth failed to do. Take the knowledge, weigh the choices, and chart your own destiny in the right way.